and welcome to our service this Sunday. We are Cornerstone Church, and as a church, our mission is to make Christ known and to make disciples. And our vision as a church, you know, in the 21st century, is to live as an authentic Christian community, serving God's purposes in Bristol, in Britain, and beyond, to wherever, wherever we may end up. My name's Kezia. I'll be your host this uh, Sunday, so I do hope you're all sitting comfortably with whatever hot drinks, breakfast, cuddly blankets you may prefer. Uh, you may notice that this Sunday is a bit different to our usual Sundays. That's because it's the first, end of the, uh, first Sunday of the month, which as we all know means family service. So there's going to be about this much more fun packed in. Not that other services aren't fun, of course. Uh, we're going to be ha having Dylan leading us in worship. And then power couple C Candice and Larry are going to be sharing this, the word with us about what is faith. So, no small task there. Um, it's so great to have you all with us and to be spending this time together with God. So, on, our, on all of our behalves, I'd like to pray just for a moment. Heavenly Father, this week has been so busy with distractions and things to be paying attention to and things to deal with. So we thank you for this time now that we can really dedicate to you, that's for you alone. I pray that what we bring here will be a service to you, um, authentic service, a real sacrifice. I pray that you will ready our hearts to hear your word and our hearts to worship you as well. Thank you for all the gifts you've given us. In Jesus' name, Amen. Right, so we will be going into worship, but just before that, we have a message from James from the students. So over to him. Hey students, welcome back. Um, great news, we've got a special event lined up on the 7th of Feb um, with our friends from Fusion over to Paul for more on that. Hey Cornerstone, hope you're well. My name's Paul. Uh, I'm based in Manchester, work for Fusion. And in a few weeks' time, myself and Roscoe, we're going to be uh, running a session on rhythms of life. Those things that we might need to embrace in this time to hear God, to follow Jesus, and to make the most this season. But also those things to resist, those distractions, those things that take us off course. Uh, so these are things that are going to form us in love for God and love for one another. So do join us in a couple of weeks' time. We're excited to see you. Thanks, Paul. Um, yeah, so again, that's on the 7th of Feb, and it's going to be uh, not at the usual time, but at 7.20 um, for a 7.30 start. So I hope to see you all there. Set me on. 
and take away You give and take away My heart will choose to say Lord, blessed be your name Give and take away Give and take away My heart will choose to say Lord, blessed be your name Good morning everyone. Today we're going to explore the question, what is faith? We're going to have a look at the life of someone who in the year 1832, that's about 190 years ago, he moved all the way from Germany to right here in Bristol. And God did some extraordinary things through him. His name was George Muller. And if you ever go past his buildings in Ashley Down that look like this, that was where he used to serve at. We're going to find out more by asking someone in church who knows quite a bit about him. Hi Jenny, thank you for um, agreeing to uh, this interview with me. So as I understand it, you used to be a volunteer at the Muller Museum. So can you tell us how long have you done it? Well, not very long really, because it only opened in September and then we've been uh, less than a year and we went into lockdown. So I, I still am a, mu a museum volunteer. We still do keep contact, but I just can't go in. Yeah. Well, I assume that as a volunteer still, that you've uh, brushed up on your knowledge of George Muller. <laughs> it's, it's very brushed during the last week, actually. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the, the, first, story, yeah. the story is always there in my mind. Absolutely. So um, the first question I like to know is, um, who was George Muller and what was his work in Bristol? George Muller was a German and uh, he went to theological college in Germany uh, but he had a lot of problems growing up as a youth and most of those problems emanated from money. He couldn't handle money. He either stole it, got into debt um, and ended up actually in prison a short time because mm. of that debt. Mm. And he gambled and did all the things that young people are really not supposed to do. That was the life he led until one night he went with a friend to home group. And uh, on the spur of the moment, it just changed his whole life when mm. he realised what Jesus had done for him. And it, there were lots of things happened after that, uh, before he actually came to England and then eventually came to Bristol in 1832. Mm. And uh, what do you do in Bristol? He started off um, as a pastor actually um, together with a friend of his, Henry Craig, and they pastored a, a church which grew rapidly it was called Bethesda Chapel. It was at the bottom of Park Street, which I'm sure mm. everybody knows that area. Uh, but it was bombed in the war, I'm afraid, so it no longer stands. Mm. So his job was pastoring. Uh, and that is uh, at that time when he noticed the plight of orphan children begging on the streets of Bristol. Mm. Yeah, that was, that was the start of, of what was to be his future, really. Yeah. Uh, do you, what can you recall about his work at orphanages and um, the building of it? Well, it was just that he was shocked to the core about children begging. And I would just like to mention that the children were probably about the age of Hope and Catherine and Shiloh and even mm. Mercy and Sam and Eli. Those mm. children had no parents at all. And mm. 
and uh, or their parents had died because of a uh, sickness. There was so much sickness and so much poverty and so much filth all around the streets of Bristol. So they had to beg and he was shocked to the core. So he uh, felt after prayer, and this is the big, big word in his life, is prayer and faith, two words. Mm. And he prayed and prayed. So it, it wasn't until, let me just look at this. Yep, it wasn't until 1836, so four years after he came to Bristol of praying, before he found a premises in Wilson Street in St Paul's and opened that premises, three-storey house, um, and that took 30 children in, en in the end. Mm. Uh, which led on to another house in the same street, which led on to another house in the same street. Uh, and he never, ever, ever asked for money. Mm. He, he relied totally and completely on the Lord to supply and touch people's hearts, which they did. Mm. Um, when, he, when they started the first house, it was so moving because he only he told his vision of what he wanted to do to his congregation. And I suppose other people find out. And, you know, somebody would give a knife and a fork, somebody else would give a cushion or a blanket mm. or something for the children to wear. The first thing was a big wardrobe that arrived and it completely furnished those houses. Mm. I remember so that, that children at that time, um, they were very poor, weren't they? And about the whole child labour issue, children had to go to work, didn't they? They Absolutely. had to do a lot of hard labour and they weren't educated. And George Muller was able to educate them and and to go to, you know, higher ranking work and all that. Yes. Um, the work that they did when they were taken sometimes off the street was in the workhouse, which was almost as bad as it was on the streets. It was such an awful place to be. Uh, but... I don't know whether that happened as early as Wilson Street because uh, the work moved on then till they, 19, 1849 when they built on Ashley Down. Mm. Uh, but when they left Ashley Down, they were able to take up an apprenticeship or they were able to go, with, mostly the girls went into service. They mm. went and uh, worked in a big, a big house. Mm. Um, and both of those situations gave them uh, not only a job, but it gave them a good place to live and food to eat mm. uh, and a good reputation if they were if they did their job well. Yeah. Uh, but I, that may not have started because the children may not have been old enough when they were in Wilson Street. Mm. But, um, but because they got so many children in St Paul's, uh, the neighbours began to find they couldn't manage it. They weren't against Muller, they agreed with him, but it, it you've got to bear in mind open sewers and no proper water supply and all those things at that time. They mm. improved during Victoria's reign, following up quite quickly. Um, by the time he built on, on Ashley Down, I think one of the houses, there was a new sewer put in and new water put in up there. So they were very, very well supplied. Mm. But the, the difference, Candice, is so amazing. And God really showed me that this week that what caused Muller the most trouble and got him into the most trouble was the misuse of money when he was a young person. Yeah. But God can change that situation in our lives and he did in Muller's completely so that Muller used the thing that had been his problem to the glory of God. And mm. he, that was the only thing that mattered to him was that God got the glory for it. Every single penny, literally, was yeah. recorded. Mm. yeah amazing it's totally amazing yeah absolutely yeah um my second question is um could you share maybe some stories in his life um where his faith was tried uh, i think his faith was tried very often in fact all he did was when his faith got tried or the problem got too big he just prayed more and that was the thing, the prayer increased and then the problem gradually just <laughs> decreased, yeah. really. Uh, but things were happening all the time in that it wasn't always an excess. In fact, there very often wasn't any spare. Mm. And the, I think the most famous story, really, and, and you, if you've read any of the books, you probably would have read it, 
and that was that I think they were still in Wilson Street then and uh, one morning they came to breakfast and so all the children sat there and Freddie touches me every time so I might well get in tears mm. uh, every they looked at their bare plates and there was no money to buy bread or anything yeah. and so Mullis said he called the staff together and, and the children he said we must pray so they started to pray and they all prayed children Muller staff everybody prayed then they got up from their knees and they sat down again and there still wasn't anything on the plane mm. and very quickly after that there was a knock on the door and uh, when they answered the door it was a local baker and the local baker had not been able to sleep the previous night and he couldn't get to sleep and he just felt that he should get up and bake bread for Muller's children Mm. And at two o'clock he started and he started breaking the bread and that knock on the door was him arriving with the fresh bread for their breakfast. But their beakers were still empty and so they had nothing to drink. So very soon after the baker had left, there was another knock on the door. This time it was the milkman and he said, could you help me? My, cart, my milk cart's broken down right outside your house. <laughs> And I've got a whole day's milk that's going to be wasted. Can the children use it? And so that was the way the prayers got answered. And that was kind of similar things all the way through. Hmm. Yeah, all the way through. He'd come down to his last few pennies and say, Lord, what are we going to do? And the next thing, somebody would give him part of the money and somebody else the rest. It, it was just, whether it was houses or bread, it was the same. Mm. Yeah, I remember um, when I was at the Muller Museum last September, I read about how almost every single thing, every brick, every window pane was just given as a gift. It's just, yeah. It's I honestly cannot recommend enough. That touch, my face particularly, was uh, one day I had to walk past, this is many years ago now, I'd heard the story vaguely, but I had to walk down Ashley Down Road, just off Gloucester Road. I recommend it thoroughly. Mm. And uh, I got down there and uh, just past a little wriggly bend in the road, there was a wall started. They've now, I think, done some new building in between there and, the, and Muller House. And I just looked at these stones and it seemed as if the wall would never end. And I just came to me like a flash of from the blue Every stone that is in this wall was prayed for. Nothing was there until it was prayed for, every single one. And then when you turn into College Road, of course, you're faced with these huge buildings. Nobody, however skeptical, can deny them. Mm. They're there. Yeah, it's amazing. Mm. It's absolutely amazing. It's our miracle, really. It's a Bristol local miracle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, my last question to you is, how has the life of George Muller and all the stories that you've read influenced your faith as a Christian? Well, unlike Muller, my faith fluctuates and probably my prayer life fluctuates. But um, just after I started at the museum, yeah, just after I started at the museum, um, it was given towards winter and it was quite cold and uh, the staff run all the Muller missionary work from the offices above the, the museum and here we were in this purpose-built building, everything beautiful, with a lovely heating and air conditioning system and nothing was working and I was sitting in my coat freezing cold and they were doing the same upstairs and I thought I was reading one of the books and there was a story about George Muller with the house I was looking at it, house number one, and the boiler had, had sprung a leak in that house and uh, winter was approaching. Muller was really worried about the children being cold. He said anything just to get that working. He organised the builder to come. He was coming the following Wednesday. But the boiler was so massive it was built in and that all had to be taken down before they could deal with the boiler. Anyway, Muller was just uh, went to the Lord just before it, um, the builders started 
And uh, what was happening was there was a very keen north wind blowing, which was so cold. It is so cold up around those houses on top of the hill. And Muller prayed two prayers. He prayed, one, would the Lord change that wind so it was no longer a cold north wind? And would he bring a mild south wind? That was the one prayer. And the other prayer he took from the Bible, from the building of uh, the rebuilding of the wall of Jerusalem, when near Nehemiah found that the men said that they would work with a will. So he said, would the men work with a will? Tuesday night, the north wind was still blowing. Wednesday morning, oh, sorry, I find this so moving. It stopped. Mm. And it was such a mild wind, they didn't need the heating. Mm. And so uh, Muller was just leaving on the Wednesday night to go up to his, to his own home. And he was told that the boss had come to do with the building. He went back to number one house. He went down into the basement and spoke to the boss. And the boss said, well, the men, the men said that they will work early and finish late to get the job done. And the foreman was there and he said, no, the men have said that they will work through the night. And so both prayers were answered, the south wind and the men working with the will in very short time. Uh, the boiler was mended and lit again and bricked up again and all the radiators were working again and all the time the south wind blew mm. and I just and I thought to myself and here I am reading this story and I'm perished <laughs> I thought well they've been praying upstairs and I'm going to join their prayers if they can do it for Muller they can do it for us that's God's children upstairs working for him and uh, what the problem was that nobody would take responsibility, the builders or the engineers and the heating people, nobody would take responsibility. Within about 10 days, Sarah upstairs got, say, came down and said, I've got a hold of the man, I've got a hold of the man. And she got a hold of the man that took responsibility and got the heating engineers in. Fine. <laughs> so there is a sign under the clock in Muller's study in the museum, which I'm sure you read, Candice, which says, yeah. God hears prayers and God hears prayers still. And so, yes, that has touched my faith very much. Mm, mm. Yeah. Really challenged us the way we think about faith and the way we pray as well. And the amount of faith that comes in, right, when, when we're praying. Yeah. I think he knew, he knew he'd been called to do it. And he would said he was torn between dealing with the plight of the orphans or giving God the glory for everything. You know, and that's what he wants. Both those things he wanted to accomplish. Mm. And he did think he was dying in his thirties. He was so ill and he didn't, he not only lived, he succeeded two wives and his daughter and lived till 92. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And traveled, and the latter part of his uh, life, which was the missionary journeys, he traveled 200,000 miles around the globe preaching the gospel. So, yeah, Amazing. says it all really, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> Thank you, Jenny, um, for, for your answers and for sharing. Um, yeah, so when, when lockdown ends, we'll hopefully we'll see you back in the museum again. <laughs> and I just hope people just just take that time to go and look because I know they'll be absolutely bowled over by the story. Yeah. Mm. Like Jenny, I've also wondered about living a life that is totally dependent on God. George Muller's experiences may be very dramatic compared to our lives, but it's important to remember that God was the one who did all these things through him, so that we know that we can trust him. In the end, God gets the glory, not man. What's really amazing is that this same God that did all these things, we can know and experience in our own lives. George wrote a few things on faith and I'll share some things that have helped me that might help you too. Not all believers are called to a life of trusting the Lord to provide without a normal job. 
And not everyone is called to build big orphan houses uh, and schools, but all believers are called to put their worries onto God, to trust him for everything, to bring everything in prayer and expect answers to their prayer according to his will. Faith isn't only needed when you don't have enough money. When George lost a key, he asked the Lord to help him find it. When he's meeting up with someone and that person is running late, he prayed that God would help him come early. When he read something in the Bible that he didn't understand, he prayed that the Holy Spirit would teach him. In the same way, you can pray with faith when you have a big test tomorrow, or when you're having a fight with your friends, or when you're feeling sad, worried, or scared, or lonely. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 16 says, And also use the shield of faith. With that, you can stop all the burning arrows of the evil one. So how can we make our faith strong? James 1.17 says, Every good action and every perfect gift is from God. These good gifts come down from the creator of the sun, moon and stars. God does not change like shifting shadows. Our faith becoming strong is a good gift, so it must come from God. So number one, let's read the word of God. Because the more you read it, the more you understand what God's character is like. That he's holy, just, kind, loving, gracious, merciful, mighty, wise and faithful. When you're in difficult times, the Holy Spirit can help you remember how God has helped his people in the past. This gives you confidence to rely on him, that you will know him, not just in your head, but also in your heart. Romans 10, 17 says, So faith comes from hearing the good news. And people hear the good news when someone tells them about Christ. And John 14, 26 says, But the helper will teach you everything. He will cause you to remember all the things I told you. This helper is the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name. So the Holy Spirit will help us when we read the word of God and as we take it in and let it sink into our hearts. Number two, we should always examine ourselves because we often do things that God doesn't want us to do, which is sin. Christians and non-Christians both need the gospel message in their lives. When struggling with sin, we can either do nothing about it and let sin destroy us, or we can try very hard and fail, or we can have faith that we can always ask God for forgiveness and that he can change us. When we fail, will we quickly run to him or hide from him? As 1 John 1 9 says, But if we confess our sins, he will forgive our sins. We can trust God. He does what is right. He will make us clean from all the wrongs we have done. Which brings me to my last thought. We should not shrink back from the moments that challenge our faith. When God gives us faith, it is given so that he can try it. It's natural for us to feel uncomfortable when we have to depend on him. It's natural for us to depend on ourselves, the people around us and our circumstances. But we should carry on all the more if we want our faith to be strong. 
the more you are being tested in faith, you will see more opportunities where God helps you. And every time he helps you, it will increase your faith. James 1 verses 2 to 4 says, My brothers, you will have many kinds of troubles. But when these things happen, you should be very happy. You know that these things are testing your faith. And this will give you patience. Let your patience show itself perfectly in what you do. Then you will be perfect and complete. You will have everything you need. And 2 Corinthians 4 verses 17 to 18 says, We have small troubles for a while now, but they are helping us gain an eternal glory. That glory is much greater than the troubles. So we set our eyes not on what we see, but on what we cannot see. What we see will only last a short time, but what we cannot see will last forever. So I hope that's helped you. Um, I'd like to close with two questions to think about. So go ahead and press pause after I've said the questions to spend some time reflecting on them and feel free to talk about it with your family and then when you're ready, press play again. Question one is, have you changed the way you think about faith? If yes, how? Number two, how does God use our faith to bless others? That's it. Are you ready? And pause. Well, I hope that was a good time of discussion for you. At the end of the service, there will be a post on the Cornerstone Facebook group where we can all share our answers to encourage each other. So now we're going to hear from Larry. Thank you, Candice, for that insight into how faith transformed the life of one man and of the thousands of children under his care. We've learned a few things so far, that faith is a gift, that it can be strengthened, and how God uses the faith of Christians all through time and throughout over the world to bring about his good purposes. The question remains for us, though, what is faith? In a purely practical sense, faith is best understood as trust. Trust not just in the facts that we know, but also in the person of God, in who he is. In building a relationship with God, we learn to trust him more and grow in faith. Christian faith is perhaps best summarised as trust in God as he has revealed himself, both in his word and supremely in his son, Jesus Christ. Some of you may know that Hebrews 11 begins with a definition of one aspect of faith, uh, a confidence in the things that we cannot see with our eyes but know to be true uh, by faith in what God's revealed. Um, and after that, after that, um, after that in, in the first few verses of Hebrews, the it goes on to list people all throughout history who, just like George Muller, showed their faith in the Lord by how they lived. Each of the people listed there had faith in God, faith that the Lord was pleased to use and grow and strengthen. The writer of Hebrews takes the reader on a journey, uh, thinking about Noah and Moses and Rahab and Sarah, the, the great deeds done by faith. A journey quite similar to us learning about God's dealings with George Muller and his life of faith. So at the end of that great Hall of Fame account in Hebrews 11 comes Hebrews 12. How does the writer of Hebrews want us to end that line of thought? Having thought about all these great people and all the great things that happened in their lives. There we read uh, in the first two verses of Hebrews 12. Therefore, since we have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith. So you see, the, he wants us to look through these examples to see the power that was behind it all along. So why am I saying all this right now? Um, we, we can read those stories and we can hear about George Muller and be amazed at the 
the things that those people did in their lives, the things that happened, um, you know, just 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 180 years ago in the city that we live in, uh, and we have the testimonies of that in the in the in the buildings that we can see. Um, I don't know about you, but sometimes we can hear a story by like like that, be amazed, and then look down at our own lives and feel discouraged because there's such a difference. We might come away thinking, "Wow, he was a great guy." Um, I'll never be like him, I'll never have a life like his. Maybe if I was around at the same time, or knew the same people, um, or maybe even just used the same words in prayer as him, maybe then I'll have a life like his. But you see, that would be to get the focus all wrong. As with Hebrews, we should look through the story and see that Jesus is the one who did all these things. It is God himself who made sure the local baker would come by and drop off the bread that was needed for the orphans that morning. Jesus, who arranged it all to happen in answer to George's prayers. The beauty is that it is the same Jesus who loves and cares for us, even despite our failings. George Muller's example, along with countless others who have run this race before us. Um, these are all powerful reminders that our God is a loving, caring and living God who really does act in response to our very real needs. So faith is not an empty wish into the wind, but it's grounded in God himself. It's the heart responding in trust and love to the holy God who loved us first. When there was nothing in us to please God, Jesus died in the cross in our place, taking the punishment of all those who would believe in him. So as we trust in him, as we place our faith in him, we are granted forgiveness and peace with God. Our salvation is secure. And as we can trust him with the eternal weight of our souls, we can definitely trust him with um, the lives, the stretch of life that he's given us here. Our God is the sovereign one who can bear the weight of our worries and hopes like no one else can. George Muller uh, once wrote about his life that his primary aim in all of his work was for God to be magnified, for everyone to see that God is still faithful and he is still answers prayers. So we can truly be inspired and encouraged by these great examples, not because of how great they were, since they were just weak, uh, sinful human beings just like us, but because of how gracious and good our God is.
Thank you, Candice and Larry, for that exploration on the gift of faith. I think the, ring, the thing I really took away from it was that it's a great reminder we have a God who, who cares enough about the small things, but is powerful enough to deal with the big things, that all, we can bring all of them to him in faith. Yeah, I'll be thinking about that this week. So that is the uh, formal end of our service, as far as servicing things goes. Uh, but we have some notices for all who would consider themselves part of the Cornerstone community. Um, first up, next Sunday we're going to be having a time of prayer together held at six o'clock in the evening on Zoom. Everybody is welcomed and invited to attend. There will be a link sent out in the Sunday morning newsletter, so next Sunday morning check your emails, the link will be in there. Um, if you do have anything that you'd like the church should be praying for and um, let Ray know ahead of time and, and we can all be praying for that and yeah again remember we have a God who cares about the little things and the big things um what's up with you hmm? uh a another notice is just the the regular plug that if you're not stuck in in a home group yet get stuck in it's again a great time to be bringing up our requests before God, to have other people pray for you and to pray for them, to study God's word and grow in faith. It really has everything. I mean, why wouldn't you? Uh, if you need details on them, then again, get in touch with Ray. She can tell you which ones are happening, uh, when and where and led by who. It, it's all online at the moment, so it should be pretty easy to join. And again, if you're wanting to chat with uh, Cornerstone folks, then come along to the Sunday morning um, we, well, we have meetups on Sunday morning before the service, um, starting at 10 o'clock, finishing hopefully just before quarter to 11 when the when this service um, premieres. So yeah, come along to those. Again, the link I think is sent out in the newsletter or will be on Facebook if not. Um, yeah, so that's everything. Go in faith, God bless and have a great week. Love you. Bye.